Okay, good morning, everyone. We're um, recording didn't go well on Monday, so we're redoing Monday's section. It's fine. Um, happy to do it if you haven't caught the prior ones. This is um, my contribution to the pandemic. A positive contribution. Hopefully, I don't make any negative ones. Um, that um, multicast, great topic, um, really more a CCIE level kind of thing. It shows up a bit in your wireless, well, it used to be the CCMP wireless, a um, little bit. But they don't really cover it in detail. It, it kind of slaps you for CCIE. It's, uh, for a lot of networks, you're running it, but you're not routing it. What do, I mean, what do I mean by that? So, for example, if you're using RIP version 2 or OSPF, on that shared segment, you've got multicast running. That's how uh, they find all the different devices, uh, find each other, establish neighborships. And you think about OSPF, and then actually there's uses two groups, addresses. Those are, um, those are a group that they do that, so they establish a designated router, they send updates to designated router, designated router sending out updates to all the other devices, uh, through neighborships, and that's all happening automatically. Uh, via multicast, you don't have to define each neighbor, that's great, but it doesn't route. TTL is one, and it's a special range of uh, group addresses. And notice I'm using that term, you're thinking it's an IP address, It's it is, but it's really a group address. So let's get into this. Let's start talking about it. Um, let's get this. To, there we go. Why should you be listening to me in the first place? Well, I've been doing. I've been designing, um, designing, building, and supporting multicast networks for at least the last five years, probably longer. But I'm having trouble finding the original date. Um, in, a, in a Cisco enterprise. So large enterprise involving WAN. Uh, my experience primarily IPv4. I have a lot of, I have a fair number of certificates. Um, shared a few here. I put in CompTIA, CompTIA, CompTIA A plus. Kind of a joke. Um, it's not that relevant to this. Right? It's great if you, if that's what you've got, man. If that's what you do, celebrate it. Um, especially when you're new, it's it, it's a challenge, right? Um, but it took that a long time ago. Uh, and then if you want to look at my full <coughs> portfolio of current certifications, that you can go to that link on the bottom. Okay. Um, and then I have a couple quick, um, the brands and models, it's going to be Cisco. That's where my experience is. I'm doing it for illustration purposes only. Uh, I, I have dipped my fingers a little bit into a couple other uh, models. Um, they're very, often very different. You have to read through very carefully what you're doing you're trying to figure out, hey, I want to do X. How do I do it in this? Um, and they, some of them, I think, look at they they look at multicast a little differently than Cisco does. The fundamentals we're going to discuss here are equivalent cross platform, but I'm just saying brands and models, illustration purposes only. Um, there's no implication of any endorsement by the vendor. I'm happy if Cisco likes my things, wants to reuse it, invites me to do a Cisco Live sometime. That'd be awesome. Um, but they're not right now. So this is my own deal. Um, I'm not using the business process of any employer or client, past or present. This is my uh, conglomeration of experience over the last number of years um, with two major uh, engagements and then some minor work here and there that uh, I try and only ex include equipment I have a direct experience with. So if I talk a little bit about Nexus or the ASRs, that's because I've actually done it on those products. Um, I'll be clear at any point if I'm going to say, well, it's going to look, it'll probably look different on, because then I'm going to tell you that I haven't touched that product. So I, I my understanding it looks different, but I'll, I'll be clear about that with you. So I want to give you. Um, as much usable knowledge as you can and to know where you need to do a little more research before moving forward. Um, and I've not received any compensation or inducement from any vendor. So no freebies, no, not even a t-shirt. So just to be clear, you know, this is not um, done on behalf of anyone other than me. Um, what's multicast? 
And the Tuesday Tech Talks, originally I was doing this uh, at, at evenings on Tuesday nights. Schedules kind of changed a little, so I ended up dropping that for a while. Um, but multicast. It, computer networking multicast is a group communication where data transmission is addressed to a group of destination computers simultaneously. It's from Wikipedia. So what's that really mean? Um, it means, uh, for example, with uh, financial trading, that getting stock quotes on the trading floor, if we do it via multicast, literally they're, they're supposed to all get it at the exact same time um, with the variations due to things like cable length, not to your packet got first, mine was second, someone else's was third um, because of multiple streams, right? So, and a group of computers can be zero or more computers. Notice I said zero, zero, um, that really could be. Um, and we'll get into a little more detail of that. This multicast was originally defined back in 1985. Think about where you were in 1985. Um, were you born yet? Um, you, you did could you tie your own shoes? Um, were you in university? Would you know where where were you? So um, if you read that original RFC 966, you'll see it looks a lot different when we get into more of the details. It's interesting because you're just saying, hey, I had this problem. I wanted to, to to send to a group of computers. How can I do that? And we'll talk about that in a second. He had a lot more he wanted to do with it. And that dropped off, you'll see, pretty quickly. Um, and the modern implementation looks a lot different than what you'll see um, in RFC 966. But it's worth taking a look at. It's very short. So I think it's five, maybe eight pages tops. Uh, I, I like to give you this um, question to, to walk through this with, to kind of hold on to as I discuss this. And the purpose of this, this particular talk is just understanding fundamentals. And it's some real basic stuff. And then you're just going to focus on what is this thing, right? So you already have a definition. So you already have like an important part of it. And then we're going to add some more detail on top of it before we start getting into tomorrow's talk where we start to talk more how it actually works. So just focus on these basics and we'll go from there. I like to include this piece. And I like to emphasize that if anything, and you listen to me, you're going to learn this on triple constraints. Talk. This comes from the project management discipline. Um, Three-legged stool. We have time, uh, quality, or scope, money, or budget as the three legs. And if you change any one, at least one, if not the other two, have to change. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you want to speed up a project significantly, I may either have to bring on more resources or I may be running a lot of overtime to get it done. Or I have to pay like a cabling vendor for weekend work that they're going to charge a premium for, right? So budget has to go up. And you're like, well, that's just dumb. How come it uh, take you two? It's only taking you two weeks instead of, you know, eight. Like, right. And then I've got people working like, you know, 12 hour, 16 hour days, you know, they're going to want some compensation for it. So, yeah, this is one of the ones. And, you know, sometimes you tell me you need in half the time, that's cool. What can we drop to make it done in two weeks? Like, what, how can we get a viable product for you in the time you have and on the budget you want to spend? So, it's an important concept. I think it's a great thing to be able to pull out when you have. Um, your leadership coming to you and saying, well, you know, this we don't have, like right now with this, the coronavirus, um, and there are things that, need, that needed to happen and they're not done yet. How can we get them done now, right? So need to bring in time. Is there anything about the, the scope or quality we can cut? Is there more money, right? Important. So to get back to that question we raised, um, around this sending to a group. So he had this problem um, he faced of, I need to, I want to update data, multiple databases simultaneously. I can do it two ways. I can do a unicast. So one-to-one -one communication, TCP, UDP, something else. There are more protocols than TCP, UDP, right? You think about it, things like ERGRP technically is its own protocol. OSPF is technically a protocol. So could be any one of these things. Um, 
if I need to deliver to more than one host with a unicast, I need to create a new connection. This isn't this is pretty straightforward. Um, I put the processing burden a lot on the sender and someone on the network. The network piece is just bandwidth, right? And the network's still doing what it does. So um, if it's inside the local LAN, I'm doing ARPs and um, so I'm putting a little bit of ARP traffic out. If it's going across the WAN, I have one stream, it goes to this IP address. Uh, it's I have another one on a different segment, so the router then does another lookup to say, okay, where, what interface does that need to go out of? And, right, so a little bit of process, a little bit of overhead in the network, a lot on the center. Broadcast, well, it's one to all. Um, Usually link local, not crossing a layer three boundary. One of the most common we see is things like when you first boot up an IP4 device and wants to do DHCP, it's gonna use the all Fs for the MAC address. Um, for its destination, it's gonna use, a, which is all ones in binary, right? We're gonna always go back to binary. And then for the IP address, it's all ones, 255, 255, 255, 255, right? Um, and that's how it's seeking out a DHCP. Um, it doesn't cross a layer three boundary. There is something called directed broadcast. So when you remember, if you have a segment like 192.168.1.0 slash 24, so that's 255, 255.255.0, .255 that the broadcast address is 192.168.1.255. Um, that's supposed to ping all the hosts on that subnet. However, in a lot of modern designs, we've now blocked that. There's some security risk that, that occur with having them. There's a way of I can use that for reconnaissance, so we block that. Um, and then we put a processing burden on the receiver. So if I was sending a UDP stream on from a uh, to a particular port number, so there's a listener for that that I send it out on a broadcast on a on a layer two broadcast. So every device, it goes down every wire. Uh, layer one, every device sees it. Uh, layer two, they see that MAC address. They say, yeah, I got to listen to that MAC address. Layer three, they said, yeah, I got to listen to that MAC address. Then it goes up the next, the next part of the stack and it says, hmm, UDP and it's port number, say, you know, 1111, uh, 1111. And it says, I don't have a listener on that, drops traffic. It had to take it through three layers, right? It gets up to layer four and says, no, nah, not mine. So, and I put burden, every every single machine on the segment has to listen to this. So, well, what do we do? We get multicast. And what's multicast doing? Well, the idea with multicast is send to a group, the, the, the real concept is one stream for every link that wants the traffic. So I, in my poor visios here, you take a look on the left-hand side, we have unicast. That router has five streams, five hosts that want traffic downstream from it. It's gonna take five copies of the traffic. They're gonna be slightly out of sync because they're all dropped on the line serially, right? They're not dropped, there's no way to drop them simultaneously on the line um, and then Busier links have more copies and they start, on the multicast side, each stream carries one copy of the traffic, so it reduces bandwidth. If a stream doesn't care about the traffic, there's a method that, sa that says, I'm just not gonna take it. We will prune that traffic. It will not go down that link. And it doesn't matter if I have one or I have many, um, your options are zero, no traffic, uh, and that, and then it's one or more, and you still get one copy. So that's the basics. Thinking about unicast, multicast, uh, TCP has to be unicast because of that um, connection orientation, three-way handshake, and then what it adds because of that is reliability and flow control. So I can say back, I missed some packets, re retransmit those, and I can, I can, if I'm constantly have retransmissions, that I'm going to slow down the traffic, right? UDP doesn't have that. Now I can do UDP unicast. So there are things like SNMP traps that are typically UDP, and that's fine. And we do that for a reason. But UDP is connectionless. It's unreliable. So the the application itself has to handle any reliability issues, not the protocol. 
Um, and it has some disadvantages because of that. It's best effort delivery. There's no congestion avoid avoidance. So one of the things you can do, like if you're doing internal nasty things inside your network, is I can, you know, bombard something with a UDP stream. Um, there's no quenching on it. I'm going to do it. I can really beat this, beat the daylights out of something with that. Um, there are duplicates, and there are actually there are duplicates and it's kind of on purpose. And you can have out-order delivery. And we're going to explain why that's important. That's going to be in a future topic. And this is another way of illustrating that issue. So from the perspective of the sender, uh, my bandwidth on unit multicast is flat. I send out that one copy. Now, if I'm sending the multicast from a router and I have multiple interfaces and all the interfaces want the traffic, I am sending more than one copy, but I'm only sending one per interface. So no matter how many receivers I have on any interface, I'm sending out one copy. Unicast, and eh? you know, if I have like my one uplink to the internet and I want to have, you know, 100,000 viewers, I'm, I have 100,000 streams. That, that adds up to a lot of bandwidth, even if it starts very, very small. So there you have it. So we're going to jump right into layer three. First of all, just identifying what's a multicast. It's called a group address. And that's important for that last point where it's a source can never be a class B group address. There, It's an address for the group, not a host. So no host owns the address. And it, it sits in this, if you remember your classical networking, and Cisco still tests on it, and it's still relevant in some things, like with RIP version 1, um, with EIGRP, has some classfulness to it if you do auto summary. That So you still need to know some of that. It's still a relevant topic after all these decades. That. But this next re, net range, class D. So if you remember class A had first, uh, first bit is a zero. For class B, the first bit is a one. Second bit is going to be a zero. Class C, uh, it's going to be one one zero, and class D is going to be one 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 zero in binary. So that one 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 zero that that defines this range of two twenty four zero 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 through two thirty nine two fifty five two fifty five two fifty five. All those are all the group addresses. Those are going to be subdivided. We'll talk about that in a second. And again, to emphasize this, it's never the source address. I don't I don't type that into an interface. An application may have that, and the application is going to do different things to it, but it's always going to be a destination address, never the source. So, you know, quiz time. Anyone want to raise their hand and say, um, you know, uh, is it? can it ever be a, uh, a source address? No. And so you go to IANA. And there's uh, you can you can Google this, come up with it. Um, you're going to see there are registered ranges. There's one that's particularly special. This reserve link local 224000 slash 24, so 224000 through 224000255. Always has a TTL of one, and it's things like I mentioned this at the very beginning, OSPF or EIGRP or RIP v2 um, that you think about it like RIP. It, my route updates to the guy two hops over make no sense. It only makes sense to my immediate neighbor, the guy who's one layer three hop away. So we set the TCL to one, that host then processes that update, and then he forwards his new, his route table off to his neighbors. So um, that's special. The nice thing is with those addresses, because they're registered by IANA, if you if you're sni if you're sniffing and you see that traffic, you can look it up. What is this? Right? It could be things like printer discovery, It'd be all kinds of things. There's an, there's another set of ranges in this 224.010 through 224.0 uh, that one that 255. TTL is typically any bigger than one, and it includes things like NTP. And inside this first round of link local, there's some important ones like 224.001, which is all uh, multicast hosts. If you're running IGMP, if you're running multicast, you need to listen on it for that. 224.002, all routers. Okay, and you're going to see, I'll talk about 
IPv6 in an in a, uh, uh, appendix later on, um, and a lot of these roll over. The only difference are things like 224.0010 for EIGRP. Well, we we do IPv6 in in hexadecimal, so the last is uh, digit is an A, which is hexadecimal for 10 instead of one zero. Okay. And there we go. Um, there's some other ranges to pay attention to. This is your source specific. And we'll talk about what that means in a later uh, segment. Actually, that was in part two. There's this minimal administratively scoped range. This is what you get to play with. This, this is, there's no registration. You can do what you need to with it. Um, your own applications, home built stuff. And also you're deploying applications where you may not want to have overlap. So for example, with your uh, wireless controllers, you have your multicast mode multicast. If I have, if I'm running uh, multicast across the WAN and um, I may want that multicast across to cross the WAN, I may not. So I'm, I may use different ad address ranges um, to control scoping, I may use different ranges so that I don't overlap these things. So that's your range. And these are some examples of like, okay, I need an enterprise range. So everyone needs to listen to that. I need to have a, uh, some regional ranges. I have a campus range. Um, and we'll talk more, more about why that make, why that's important. So, to, so there's two things. We, remember we talked about with that broadcast, right? that comes down that layer one to you. The MAC address of all Fs is, i supposed to listen to this, right? And then you get to an, an IP address, and the broadcast was all 250, it was 255, 255, 255, right? You need to listen to this well. So already with multicast, we have this IP address that if you have an application that's using multicast, it has a group it's listening for or it's sending to. So if you're if you're listening for that traffic, the thing comes in, you look at it, you see that the that IP address, that IP group address, you know, yep, <clears throat> that's traffic I want. And then hopefully it matches um, UDP and the right or the whatever protocol and the right port number. So it really is traffic, not some bogus traffic. So but the MAC address is also different. So with multicast, we can kill the traffic pretty quickly. So each multicast group address gets a, spe a special destination MAC address. So there, when they first introduced multicast, we had to make some changes into the, the basic driver stacks um, and perhaps the card level before, hey, I'm listening for two things, broadcast or my unicast, otherwise don't care wave off. There were some odd ones like Apple had a broadcast multicast um, uh, or a broadcast, excuse me, a broadcast uh, MAC address that they used for Apple devices. So you'd see that in your traffic, um, Apple header, all Fs on the back end. And that was a way you plug in Macs on your Ethernet. This is under the old EtherTalk that there's a way for them to broadcast to each other. Um, that a lot of other very early cards there they have those two things that was it right now we introduce we need this new capability and the way we do this is we create this header 01005e right so you remember um, a, a MAC address is um, six bytes long and you have IP address is four bytes. Well, I'm, I'm taking six and I'm actually stealing one extra bit. I'm setting the 25th bit to one. So in these two examples, I, I wish I had picked a different example to do this. Um, I'm, I'm taking the last 23 bits of the um, address and I'm taking the binary, dropping it down on the end here. Now, and of course, we're dealing with decimal, binary, and hexadecimal. So all these numbers look different. So, you know, one I have this 128, which is 
that is correct for 128 and it looks like 80 in hex okay, but one is still one so yeah so that means I can put out these two radically different group addresses and at layer two I'm still listing for that I'm still going to take it. I'm going to see if if I was listing for the top address and I get the bottom, well, I get to drop it. So, but also if this was 239.201.1, it would still look like 224.72.128.1. It's MAC address window. So I can have radically different IPs and still have, which, this is going to be in your designing, particularly in this 239 scope where you have control. You're going to do some design work and say, hey, I'm going to do these so I my hosts don't process at layer two. If they get that, they're going to know to drop it. I'm going to keep these things segregated. So it's a little extra work. But this is nice that I can I can minimize my host. Layer one, we think about how Ethernet started as a big piece of coax. You had vampire clamps. You tapped into it. And you ran like an AUI attachment unit and interface back to your host machine. That y'all, the electrical signal went to you regardless. Wireless is like that. The wireless signal, even if it's a different SSID, whatever, I still, I still get it. However, by the MAC address, I can see that hey, I don't want to do this, so I stop processing at layer two. I just, I'm done. This is me. So this is why this is important. I want to introduce these components just so you can take a look and see these are things we're going to be start listing for, start looking for. There are things like boundaries. So I can actually set a, a boundary on a layer three interface and say, I'm not going to pass this multicast traffic. Um, not beyond this link. Um, rendezvous points. And that's about how, when we're doing multicast across layer three, how, do a, how does a sender find a receiver? That's going to be a concept we're going to learn about. IGMP on the local LAN, Internet Group Management Protocol, how do I know who wants traffic and uh, whether at a router, uh, I should be asking layer three, I've got a sender somewhere else that, hey, does this, this host wants that traffic? I need to get it to him. And then MSCP, uh, multicast source discovery protocol, there's ways of keeping uh, rendezvous points synced. We'll, we'll go into all the configuration and the challenges and whys of all that stuff in future segments. But I wanted to kind of put all this stuff out. So here's some pegs to hang your hat on, right? So these are things you're looking for, listing for as we go forward in these different uh, classes. So that's what I wanted to talk about for today. Um, um, at time, I'm happy about that. Um, certainly, at any time, feel free to ask questions. Uh, if I'm missing the chat, I will um, answer as quickly as I can. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the um, comments on the uh, any of the links. Right? I'll get notified about it. I'll take a look at it. So, what I want you to do is start making inventory of the applications in your network and what are their design requirements now. Probably you don't need to think about EIGRP, OSPF, RIP v2, some of those things that are link local. Um, I'm not going to be as worried about. These are more particularly things that need to cross layer three segments. And then there's IGMP version. So as more as you look into the requirements, they're going to say requires v2 or better, requires version three. Uh, and MLD is multicast listener discovery, and that's for IPv6. And version one is equivalent to uh, IGMPv2. IPv6 is newer, so they learned and they took on, they went straight to the, the lessons they learned in v2 and adopt that for v1. And then version three is equivalent to MLD v2. Um, do I need a range of addresses? Do I need a single address? Think about, um, and it, vendors will do things that are that I consider hanky. So a vendor says, oh, just use this address, right? Well, did you register that address? No. Well, it shouldn't be where you're doing it. Look on the IANA list. You can look that up, see if the, what they're telling you to do, is that something that they've registered? Did they actually own that? Or are they just, because when it's not registered, then somebody else, another vendor can say, no, you got to use that, and they're going to conflict. So 
Do you need to assign them? Are they defined by standard? Where are you going to document it? Um, if you're depending on something like I, like ping sweeps and all that, well, that gets kind of weird with multicast. So, you know, do you have your spreadsheet? Do you have a tool like SolarWinds, um, I, uh, IPAM, Blue Cat, something like that, um, IP control? What do you have and how, where and how are you going to document it? Uh, and then you're going to start thinking about there's this scope you have that you can play with. How am I going to need to do that? And some of that is going to look at the design of your applications, and you're going to see how they how are they bounded. Um, now, if you're a switch and a router and no other offices, this is CCIE question, test question kind of thing. It's not what you're going to do with day day to day because your scope is local. Biggest thing to worry about is okay. I'm gonna keep this on this this VLAN and something else. I'll use this other one on that VLAN. You may have that, but you're not having these bigger questions. Some of it you do need to care about. Whether I need to act, do I need to turn on IGMP v3? Yeah, you care about that. But some of the things in the scoping administrative range. Well, the good part is if you do plan it well and you think about what you're gonna do with it, that if you're ever acquired, hey, at least when you do get acquired and assuming it's a larger company, that you look like you know what you're doing. Um, and that makes them happy. Um, and, you know, they're more like, hey, come join our group. You actually understand this? Awesome. So uh, going beyond that, um, thanks for watching. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I think when I get up subscribers, I can get a better link. Um, in the meantime, sorry, you can cut and paste it off the slides. Slides will be on um, SlideShare. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can follow me on Facebook. Yeah, I don't friend. I don't accept friends if I don't know you, if I don't have a connection to you, um, typically. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, on politics on Twitter. Eh, maybe you don't do Twitter, but LinkedIn's the best one. Connect me on LinkedIn. I generally, if you don't feel like you're a scam, I'm going to take you on LinkedIn, and that's why I try and post my stuff in SlideShare. Um, it's the LinkedIn product, and it's there. You can suggest future topics in the in the comments. This thing is going to last for weeks. This could take weeks. So while you're locked inside, this is great. If you miss an episode, binge watch. Yay. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's some older ones. I'm, I'm updating them with this new con. I've refined the content to two years of more, more experience. Um, but there you have it. And thanks for watching. Let's stop the recording.